Thank you for coming tonight. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Psalm 35. We're going to be doing part two of Jesus in the Psalms. I'd like to welcome you to uh, Calvary Chapel AG, Royal Grande. Yeah. And our vision, I mean, uh, simply put, we, we are striving to love God and love people to the best of our ability. So help us, God. And sure, you know what? Maybe we're not perfect at it, but it's that whole perfecting part. We're perfecting it. And we're asking the Lord to give us the strength, and we're asking the Lord to give us his Holy Spirit, because that's really the only way we can perfect anything, right? I mean, there's none of us here that are perfect. That's just a fact. But the Lord empowers us, and he encourages us, and he even instructs us to perfect. And so maybe for some of us, hey, man, we're, we're perfecting just our own selves. Maybe we're perfecting, you know, our, our thought life and our, our heart. You know, we're perfecting um, forgiveness. We're, we're perfecting um, our marriage. We're perfecting our parenting. We're perfecting our friendships. We're perfecting our work ethics. We're perfecting something. And this is what I love about God. He's so gracious and compassionate, and he's so patient with us. And I think for us tonight, I just, I want you guys to know that, that God is so patient with us. He is more patient with us than we are with our own selves. And he's definitely more patient than we are in our patience with other people, right? Can I get an amen? I mean, especially if you got kids, teenagers, and things like that, you know what I'm talking about. But, I mean, God is just so patient, he's so gracious, and he's so compassionate. And he's so ready to help, he, he's ready to assist He's ready to empower. He's ready to give us wisdom, which we find in the Word, which is the reason why we always get into the Word of God, because I can't rely upon my wisdom. My wisdom sometimes is mixed with feelings, uh, what I ate the night before. Um, You know, my my wisdom sometimes is not wisdom. Sometimes my wisdom is an oxymoron. It's a fool's wisdom. And so I can't trust it all the time. But the Word of God is reliable, and it's absolutely one that you can base your entire life upon. you got to understand that the disciples, that the people that wrote the Bible, the authors that God used, uh, many of them died for what they believed in. I mean, they, they, they were willing to give it all they had. And so to me, I, that just gives me some credibility because, see, for me, I, I, like to know, I like to know that what I believe in is 100%. I like to believe in you know, that, that it's not going to fall off from me because I've been burned before. And so I want to make sure that if I'm going to give my entire heart, if I'm going to open my heart to it, if I'm going to give my mind to it, myself to it, I want to know that it's going to sustain me for the rest of my time, that it's, gonna, that it's something bigger and better than what I have because I'm out of options. I need God. And we've been going through, um, you know, the book of Psalms and, and just kind of just studying it. And, and we've hit that part, that area that really, really just captivated my attention and just seeing Jesus in the Psalms. And when I read the New Testament and we're reading, you know, like in the Gospels, for example, or even some of Paul's letters, he, he'll make a reference as it is written. You'll see that phrase, as it is written. And then he quotes something that was written back in the day. And for me, I'm like, man, I, I want to know, I want to know back in the day. I like back in the days. You know, when I used to watch like the Transformers back in the 80s, when I used to watch Thundercats, when I used to watch Voltron, when I used to watch, you guys know, you guys that grew up in the 80s, you know what I'm talking about, G.I. Joe. I always wanted to know the origins. How did it start? Who started it? How did it start? I always wanted to know the background story, which is the reason why I like the Godfather 2, because Godfather 2 takes it back to where it all began, with Vito Corleone. You know what I'm talking about? No? Okay. You guys that do are like, don't be ashamed. Come on now. Even like Lord of the Rings. I want to read the Cimmerillion. Because I want to know how it all started. How did it lead up to the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and all that fun stuff? And so here we have in the Bible many things that are written about Jesus. And when it's written about Jesus, something that he said or something that he did, there's a phrase that goes with it that goes, as it is written, as it was prophesied, basically. And I shared with you guys last week, we went over 10 of them. And I shared with you that a lot of the ones that were fulfilled in Jesus' time 
He was fulfilling things that were written a thousand years before his time. So when it was written by King David, most of them were written by King David. Some of them were written by the sons of Korah, and some are, you know, we don't know who wrote them, but in Psalm, talking about Jesus, referencing Jesus. They were fulfilled by Jesus a thousand years later. That's impressive to me. That's how I know that the Bible is God's word. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than everything I know. It's bigger than this country. It's bigger than this world. It's, it's divine. And that's what I want. That's what I need in my life is divine. And so last week we went over 10. Today I plan on going over 13. So there's 23 um, psalms or, or references in the book of Psalms concerning Jesus. And so I had you guys open up to Psalm 35. Before we get there, though, um, this is what it says in Psalm 119, verse 60. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Talking about the word of God. I like it reworded this way. The very essence of your words is truth. All your just regulations will stand forever. You know how many times they have tried to obliterate the word of God? Even before the New Testament was written. I mean, the enemy and just society in general Kingdoms in general, secular kingdoms, pagans, whatever, have tried to eradicate the word of God. And then even after the New Testament, even more so, because now we're talking about Jesus, and the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, so now it's like, man, now it's really on. Now the enemy really wants to obliterate the Bible. And they have tried so hard, countries have tried hard to get rid of the Bible and yet it continues being the most popular and the most sought out and the most, um, you know, printed and the most given out for free. To this day, still, Bible's number one. That's divine. That's bigger than me. That's bigger than this country. That's bigger than this world. You can't stop this. That's divine. And your very essence of your words is truth, and that's why it says we'll stand forever. This will never cease to exist. Never, ever. Psalm 18.30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. And really, when it comes down to it, I mean, really, the final question is this. After it's all said and done, here's the question. Will you choose to believe or not believe? Will you choose to trust or not trust? And that's it. And then... Whatever the decision is, whatever the answer is to that question, but for those who trust in him, this is what they're going to find out about God, that his way is perfect and that his word is proven and that he is a shield to those who put their trust in the word. Can I get an amen? amen. And you guys that have been following the Lord for a long time, you guys have been obedient to the word of God, you guys are into your devotions. Pastor Steve talked about that this last Sunday, the importance of being in the word of God on a regular basis. Right? The goal is to be in a, on a daily basis. How the Lord proves himself a shield. He proves himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. And so Psalm 35, written by King David, it's an imprecatory psalm. Imprecatory simply means that when you read the psalm, the person that wrote the psalm, in this case King David, he was asking God to handle business for him. Lord, I am so mad. I, I'm just fed up with these enemies of mine. Can you please just handle them? Right? And, and I asked you guys last week, ever feel that way? Still feeling that way? I, I get it. I know what that feels like. Been there. And so, like, when you read Psalm 35 and you read the first 10 verses, man, David is like, Lord, just obliterate them, expose them, pants them, do whatever it takes to humiliate them, end them, squash them, uh, uh, poison, whatever. I mean... He has to be careful because the Bible does say that you can be angry, just don't sin. And here's the cool thing about that psalm in verses 1 through 10. There's anger there. There's frustration there. But there's no sin. And so, like, if you're, not, like, perfecting griping or if you're perfecting venting or if you're perfecting, like, man, I'm going off right now. Psalm 35 verses 1 through 10 is a good way to learn how to do it rightly. Psalm 35 is also known as a lamentation psalm. Psalm 35 is about how the Lord is the avenger of his people. Now you got to remember, David, he's asking God to handle the people that are pursuing him and persecuting him. 
What this psalm is about is how the Lord avenges his people. Hey, you got people that are persecuting you, people that are persecuting us. We got society at large, right? Persecuting us in our ways, persecuting the word of God and what we believe in, persecuting our faith, trying to end churches, trying to make it illegal really to worship God the way God says that we are to worship him. And sometimes we get mad at those people, like, man, Lord, just that they would not get voted in, that they would cease to exist, whatever the case might be. But know this, the Lord God is the avenger of his people, so do not fret. Do not live in fear. Don't panic. These things must happen if we're ever going to go to heaven. We want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I I, I want to be with my heavenly father for eternity. Well, these things must happen. We must go through this in order for that to happen. So well, then bring it, Lord. Amen. And amen. Because the Lord in the end is the avenger of his people. And so we see in verse 19 of Psalm 35 that Jesus is hated without a cause. Ever had that happen to you? Where you thought they were a homie? You thought they were a buddy? BFF? But you realize that it was only on Facebook or MySpace, remember that? (laughs) On Twitter, Snapchat, and whatever else is out there nowadays. And then you find out that they've been talking smack behind your back. That they've been saying some things about you or have been doing things to you or towards you that proves and shows that they're not your friend. Jesus is hated without a cause. He understands what that's like. Out of nowhere, it just happens. And so it says in verse 19, Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. Let them not rejoice over me. Let them not have victory over me. Haters are always going to hate, right? Haters hate. And anytime they see us struggling or falling or something, boom, they pounce. Whenever we have something to say, hey, look, at, look what happened. This is a blessing. We want hearts and likes and thumbs up. They don't give us that. They give us other things. But we see this fulfilled in John chapter 15, verses 24 through 25. If I had not done, this is Jesus, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, who else came and healed the sick like Jesus did? Who else fed the multitudes like Jesus did. Did any of the Pharisees do that? Did any of the Sadducees do that? Any of the scribes? Did any of the prophets? Not like Jesus. And so Jesus is like, man, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin, but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. And this is Jesus quoting Psalm 35. Hey, that's a reference to me. And again, like I shared last week, here's David talking about, man, this is what I'm struggling with, and Jesus coming alongside of him going, I know exactly what you're going through. Know that tonight, whatever you're going through, whether good or bad, God knows exactly what you're going through, and and Jesus is right next to you. Just know that. He is holding you. He is carrying you. He's assisting you. He's right there. All you have to do is turn to him and stay with him. Turn to Psalm 40, please. also written by King David, also a, it's a combo type psalm, it's a praise psalm, but it's also a psalm of lamentation. Um, The name, the subtitle for this psalm is Faith Persevering in Trial. Hey, so are you going through trials right now? Are you going through a tumultuous time? Are you going through various trials like James talks about? Well, this psalm right here, Psalm 40, is, is about having faith in the midst of those trials. Are you walking through the valley of the shadow of death, having faith that perseveres even through the valley of the shadow of death, even through trials, multitude trials? And so we read in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, how Jesus delights in God's will. Check it out. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. I love reading this in this psalm because this psalm 
is about going through trials. And I've been tempted to give up on Jesus when I'm going through trials. I've, I've been tempted to just go, man, what's the point of this? Man, why, why is it like this? Why is it always this bad? Lord, how can, it, how can you let it get worse? Why are you letting it get worse? And I'm tempted to just kind of throw in the towel and go, forget it. I'll figure it out myself. That's the temptation. And I'm sure, as David was writing this, I'm sure there was that temptation in him. But then he writes, but you know what, Lord? It's not about me. It's about you. And though I'm frustrated, though I'm upset, though I do not understand, I'm confused, whatever the situation might be, this is what I'm going to tell you, Lord. I'm going to delight doing your will. And with David, you got to understand, he was being persecuted because he was doing God's will. And so he, he didn't step back and go, see, that's what I get. That's the reward. That's the thanks I get, God. I do your will, and all of a sudden things fall apart. Forget it. I've seen a lot of people do that. I've done that before. I've backslidden plenty of times early on in my, you know, journey with the Lord. But I had to learn to have a faith that perseveres even in trial because hard times come even to the Christians. Can I get an amen? amen. But God is with us the whole time as we go through the trial. And the trial is not for want. It's not, it's not just something that happens just because it's fun to see his children suffer. No, the Lord actually uses us to develop us, to mature us. The Lord actually uses trials to remind us that we are not to settle here on earth and be all about what we see around us, but that we need to be heavenly minded. Oh, see, I get that now. When I was 20, I didn't get that. But now that I'm 40, it's like, yeah, okay, Lord, please, quickly. The sooner the better. I said that on Sunday night, but then I remember, hey, but look, at, there's a lot of people that I love, friends of mine that I'm witnessing to that are not born again. So I say quickly for me, but what about them? You know, someone prayed for me, and I gave my life to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So we must pray for the ones that have not given their lives to the Lord. Can I get an amen? And so whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, in pointing out that Jesus is greater than all, he said, therefore, when he, Jesus, came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. This is Jesus talking to his father. You know, Jesus, when he walked this planet, could have started everything all over again, like in the Matrix. Remember when it just got reset? He could have done that, but he didn't. He could have come in and overthrown everything all kingdoms that were hostile towards him. He casted out demons left and right. He would have put Satan in check in a heartbeat. He could have restarted and reset everything, but he didn't. Because that's not what God wanted. He didn't come to change the world. He came to save the world. And in order to save the world, Jesus had to die. He was willing to go all the way. And so he said, a body you have prepared for me. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to die for everyone. And then he says, behold, I've come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Remember in the garden? Remember he was like, Lord, I'm so scared. And he was, he was terrified. Popping blood vessels on his face. He was so anxious. But then he said, nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. And he went through with it and he died on the cross for our sins so that you and I may be born again. Amen? Amen? Psalm 51, you see David, when he's repenting after committing sin, he says something real similar. He says, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite, meaning remorseful and repentant heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. I used to do this whenever I would get in trouble, I would go to church so that when it was time for me to go to court, the Lord would have favor on me and I wouldn't get arrested again. I mean, that's really, it's trying to work the system, right? I would do my community service at church so that I can go, see, judge, I go to church. I was just trying to work the system. I thought that, okay, if I, maybe if I, if I cuss less or if I, do more good things, maybe then I can get like God's favor upon me. 
But that's not, that's not what the Lord desires. He doesn't want sacrifice and burnt offerings. He doesn't want works. You know, back then, a sacrifice and a burnt offering cost you something. People like to give money. They, they like to tithe their guilt away. And they feel like the more they give, like, okay, if I give more, then the Lord's going to love me more. It doesn't work that way. That's not what God wants. What does God want? What is he looking for in all of us? Just a broken spirit. That's what he's looking for. A, a heart that's remorseful. A heart that's willing to repent. Repent from what? I mean, the sin of all sins. This is it. My sin against you, Lord, is my independence from you. That's my sin. And in my independence, I became a famous person. I became a successful businessman. I became a gangster. I became, you know, whatever the case might be. But in my independence of you, I did my thing. I was God of my life. That's really the sin of all sins, really. Not you, God, me. And that's what the Lord is looking for, a heart that's remorseful and repentant of that. And David got it in Psalm 51. Psalm 41, also written by King David. Go ahead and flip to Psalm 41. Also a praise and a psalm of lamentation. And Psalm 41 is about the blessing and suffering of the godly. Us that have been walking with Jesus, we know both the blessing and the suffering. We know what it's like to be blessed, but we also know what it's like to suffer through. And so do not be surprised if you find yourself suffering through. Amen for the blessings. I'll take blessings all day. The sufferings, I'm a little reluctant on those. I don't like those very much. But they're going to happen. And so you that have just given your life to Jesus, you find yourself going through a hard time. You find yourself kind of suffering through your flesh. You find yourself, you feel like you're kind of spinning out of control. Understand that this is part of the process. It's called changing. Metamorphosis is what the Bible says. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. By nature, we're a stubborn people. Independent people, you don't tell me what to do. Us Americans especially, you don't tell me what to do. This is America, and I'm an American. Booyah. Tell me what to do. And so when we give ourselves to Jesus, and he begins to tell us the things that we need to do, sometimes there's a little fight. And that's where the, the suffering comes. Sometimes the suffering just comes because we're being godly. And people are making fun of us, and they're mocking us, and they're questioning us, and they're calling us bigots, and they're calling us judgmental, and they're you know, saying all these things because we don't do the things that they do. And so Psalm 41, when you read it, you'll see that it begins and it concludes with praise to God. But in the middle of it, it speaks of the plight of a person suffering from a serious physical illness. So David in Psalm 41 was sick. There's a lot of people in our church that are sick right now. They're going through some real heavy-duty illnesses. And when they talk about it, man, especially the ones that have been going through it for a long time, some of them, they, they just they don't know what to do. They're at their wit's end. So when they talk about it, they just fall apart. They cry because they don't know what to do. They're done. They're out of options. Some of us, we have family members that are going through some gnarly illnesses. And it breaks our heart, messes us up. We suffer with them because we love them and we care about them. And sometimes we wonder, God, why have you not healed them? Will you please heal them? Sometimes that healing is a heavenly healing, and sometimes it's a physical healing. Either way, though, I love that Psalm 41 begins and concludes with praise to God. It's not a complaint to God. It's not a gripe to God. It's a praise to God, even in the midst of a serious physical illness. Here's the truth of it all. Jesus' victory over the enemy. Amen. One day there will be no tears. One day there will be no sickness. There will be no death. You read that in Revelation chapter 21. No more. Jesus is conqueror of all. Victory over the enemy. Victory over death. Victory over sin. Amen and amen. And so as he writes in Psalm 41, verse 9, he talks about how David was betrayed by a friend. Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be betrayed by a friend. Ever been betrayed by a friend? Oh, man, that one hurts the most. To have a complete stranger come up to you and start something, slap you across the face, I can handle that better than a homie, a friend, a brother. 
sister, burning you. And so it says in Psalm 41, verse 9, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Even my friends have turned against me. Oh, that one hurts. That one is deep. Some people don't recover from that. Matthew 26, verses 14 through 16, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot. Okay, that means that Jesus loved Judas Iscariot because he called him friend. He called him familiar one. He was a brother. Jesus loved Judas Iscariot. But one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver, which is, by the way, another prophecy about Jesus. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Man, it wasn't just a one-time thing like, oh, dude, I had a moment of weakness. No, he planned it out. He could have repented. He could have said, hey, Jesus, can I, can I confess something to you? But he did it. And he waited for an opportunity to betray him. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he, who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them, and he drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? You're my brother, my friend. Are you betraying me like this? He knows what it's like to go through that. Psalm 45 was written by the sons of Korah. It's a royal psalm. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 45. Psalm 45 is about the glories of the Messiah and his bride. Who's his bride, by the way? That's right, the church. And you know what Jesus says about the church? She is fine. She is so beautiful. And when you read Revelation 21, 22, man, oh, that's the way it's, the bride is described. We're described as beautiful. We're beautiful. Hey, ladies, I know sometimes you struggle with that. You look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, mm-mm. Mm -mm. That's a hard one. Maybe some of us guys, too. I know sometimes I do. When I got this haircut, I'm like, uh, ooh, too much too soon? I don't know. <laughs> what are you going to do? It's too late. I almost wore a hat. Stevie, I, I see. You like it? Thank you, Stevie. I appreciate that, bro. He has good hair, so I take that as a compliment. But sometimes we look at ourselves just as people in general, and we don't see anything beautiful about us. And not just looks, but just to offer. Like, just beautiful. Like, man, I wish I was a better person. I wish I was like, I, I wish I was as patient as so-and-so. Oh, I wish I was a, a good of a mother as, you know, and we fill in the blank and we compare ourselves to other people and we wish we were other people rather than being content in who God has created you and where you are in your journey. We're, we are all in different parts of our journey. And oftentimes the lesson here is be content in whom I've created you to be. That's one of the things that I loved about my wife. Even before I, we, we started dating, uh, the thing that attracted me to her was her confidence. Not her cockiness, her confidence. And I remember her saying one time, you know, she was struggling with that. She was 16 years old, 17 years old. She was struggling with the way she looked and how she's not beautiful and not good enough. And then she, she said that the Lord spoke to her and basically said, so what you're saying is, I'm not good enough. What you're saying is that how I created you is not good enough. That hurts me. And right there, my wife's just like, all right, that's it. God is good enough. And he created me like this, so this is good enough. And I need to learn to be content with the way God has created me, the way I look, the way I am, my persona, my personality, my characteristics, and just give it to the Lord. Lord, use it. And when she said that, I'm like, man, this girl's ahead of the program. It's one of the main things that really attracted me to her because she was just so confident in a very humble and beautiful way. She was truly, she still is beautiful because she knows who she is in Christ Jesus. And so for anyone of you that are struggling with your self-esteem, especially you ladies, please, find your confidence in Christ. When he created you, you're not a mistake. You're not a dud. You're perfectly created. It talks about how you are his workmanship. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the workshop. 
Let's try that again. The workshop. That's right. We have several generations of workshop. That's the high school group, by the way, the workshop. There's our gang sign right here. Workshop for Jesus. E210. Can I get an amen? Yeah, that's right. It's part of my background. I'm sorry. But God is good. God is good. He says that you are his poem. A poem. Poems are beautiful. You are his artwork. So when you look at a beautiful sunset, that's, that's what you're compared to, a beautiful sunset, beautiful sunrise. Anywhere that you see that's beautiful, when we look at that, we're like, man, God created that. That's a, a, a work of art. The Lord puts you in the same category. In fact, he puts you above, even above the angels, because even the angels ask the Lord, why are you so mindful of them? What is it that you're so interested in them about? And if we were just to know that, right? Man, God is so interested in me. He is so in love with me. He has created me exactly who I am, the way I am. How can I use this for God's glory? And just have a confidence in Christ Jesus. Hey, that brings about a joy of our salvation and really our existence. And then to bestow that to our daughters and to our sons as we raise up the next generation. As we share that with broken people that are coming from the streets, never had anyone telling them how beautiful they are and how important they are. Always ridiculed. Always abused. In, in more ways than one. And they come to church broken, seeking some kind of a fix, some kind of a band-aid. But we got more than that. We have Jesus, greater than a band-aid and a fix. Some people are coming to get a fix because they've been worked by the fixes that they've put themselves into out in the world. They're just broken people trying to heal themselves. And if only they were to know that God created them with a purpose in mind and that in Christ Jesus, that purpose is immediately activated no matter how old you are. That plan, that purpose is immediately activated. How are they going to know that if we, the church, don't know that? So we need to know that, and we need to share that. The Lord calls us his bride, more than a servant, more than disciples, more than followers. It's much more intimate than that. It's much more personal, much more close than that. It's as close as he could possibly get bride. That's what we are to the Lord. Jesus wants to be your quote-unquote husband. He wants as close as possible. Let him. Some of us, see, we beat ourselves up, man. We're just like, no, I'm not good enough to go to the Lord today. I'm so bad. I've been so bad. I've been this and that. And you got a list of all the bad things you've done. And you actually separate yourself from God when at that moment is exactly when you need to run to God. See, I love it when my wife needs something. She comes, hey, honey, can you help me with something? Yeah, what do you need? I need you to open a jar. All right, I got this. <laughs> All right, baby, hold up. Put it back. And then she gets it. Ah, she gets it. And I'm like, hey, I helped you. I helped you. I loosened it. I did something. I put my hand grease on it. I don't know. I did something. But I love it when my wife needs me and I can be of, of, of help to my wife. And, and the thing about it is the truth of the matter is we always need Jesus. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are. We always need Jesus. And Jesus is just ready at any, every given moment. He is ready to assist us if we would just turn to him right from the get-go, right from the start, and go, Lord, I need your help right now. What do you need? Forgiveness? Can you, can you catch my tears? Uh, can you give me some kind of confidence? Can you show me that my kids are not possessed devils or something, anything? A glimmer of hope, Lord, that my kids are doing something good because you know we look at our kids the way they behave and then we blame ourselves like i'm such a bad parent right 
just gets discouraging sometimes, like overwhelming. Whatever the situation might be, I'm just throwing it out there, telling you some of the things that I've struggled with in my own personal life. And Jesus has met me at every single one, every single one, and has helped me through every single one. I can tell you confidently that when you turn to Jesus, boom, he's there. He is so there. So fall before him lest you fall apart from him. Amen? That's as far as we're going to get today. So let's pray it up. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you that your spirit is the one that runs the church. You're the one that leads the worship. You're the one that leads the Bible study. It's your word. Lord, we just thank you that you've spoken a specific word to all of us here. And I just pray, Lord, that as your bride, we would, we would take it to heart. That one, we would take it as a compliment. That we would take it as an encouragement, not criticism. That we take it as a good thing, not a bad thing. Lord, that we would be encouraged by what you have said to us tonight. Help us to walk in your love. Help us to be confident in your love. Help us to be confident in your word and the way you describe us in your word, how we are beautiful to you. Poem, artwork, masterpiece. Will you receive that word tonight? You are God's masterpiece. You are God's poem. And I know that as we think about that, it's real easy to retaliate with a reason as to why we're not poem or masterpiece. It's real easy to bring up our past failures. It's real easy to bring up present failures. It's real easy to do that, and I get it. But to that, I would say know that God is still with you in your journey, wherever you find yourself right now. And to him, you're still beautiful. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, you're worth it. Not with words, but with actions on the cross. You're worth it. I'd do it all over again. And I really believe this, that if it was just you that would respond to the cross, Jesus would die just for you. I know that for a fact, because his love for us is so amazing. It's bigger than us. And yet he wants to give it all to us. So will you stop fighting against his word? Will you start believing his word? Will you begin fighting the lies from the enemy? Perhaps from people? Perhaps from yourself? Will you fight those lies with the truth? Because the truth is forever truth is forever. So Lord, for all of us that need to hear that, come upon us with your Holy Spirit. Touch us, Lord, with your heart. Touch us, Lord, with your spirit. Fill us with your word, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.